Ready? Good morning, dear friend. I want to welcome you to the Sunday morning broadcast from the Mountain View Independent Baptist Church. This is Preacher Bobby. Appreciate everybody that's listening this morning. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, today, it should be airing on Father's Day, so we've got a Father's Day message. And uh, we want to lift all the fathers up to the Lord, and we thank God for the godly fathers. And God sent us a great blessing when he sent a, a father. I'm going to be in Luke chapter number 15 this morning. And the Bible gives us an example of a father that had two sons. And one stayed on the farm, and he, he uh, helped his dad and did what was right, but one had rebellion in his heart, and uh, there are fathers who've experienced that. So we're going to look at the Bible this morning. I uh, want to take just a minute and Luke 15 and verse number 11, but take a minute to invite each and every one of you, if you don't have a home church, to come out and be in service with us. We're located on Myers Lane. Just go to the Food Line store, turn down the road between Food Line and Dollar Store. We're right in front of you. Our Sunday school begins at 10 a.m., morning worship service at 11, evening worship service on Sunday at 6 p.m., Sunday, Wednesday night Bible study is uh, 7 p.m., and our kids' connection meets at 6, and we have classes in our Sunday school and our youth group for all ages and teachers for everyone. So if you don't have a home church and you want to get your children involved in church activity, uh, bring them out here and uh, let them be a part of this. Uh, Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse number 11. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, Father, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Father God, as we come to you, thanking you so much for this day, for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we pray, God, that you would just touch this message that you would go throughout the radio and that, Lord, that you would uh, bless those who are listening. You lift up every father this morning. And, God, that you would encourage every father, every husband, every home, every family. God, we pray, Lord, for those families that are under attack. That rebellion has entered into the hearts of the children. Lord, that you would just speak to them this morning. Lord, we thank you for WLAF radio station and for everything that they do for us and for our church. Lord, we pray for our first responders, the police, our rescue squad, and firefighters. Lord, we pray for the doctors, the EMT, the nurses, the hospital. We pray for our military and for their families and wherever they are that you'd keep them safe and bless them. Pray for our government leaders from the White House on down. We pray that this country would turn back to you. Lord, we love you, we thank you, giving you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it all. For it's in Christ Jesus' precious, holy, and saving name we do pray, and amen. If you look back in verse number 11, you're going to find something that is in many homes. He said there was a certain man that had two sons. Now, the dad didn't give his name, the Bible doesn't give his name, but God knows exactly who he is. 
And if you'll find that if you have more, if, if you just have the one child, you figure that child out. And it, you know if anything goes on, who did it? It was the one child. But if you have two or more, especially if they're two boys or more, you're going to find they're not the same people. They have different personalities. They have different discernments, different ways of perceiving. They have different ways of viewing the world, different ways of accepting authority. They're just two different people. They're, they can sit at the same home, the same parents, the same teaching, the same everything. Uh, but yet they're different people, and you're going to find you don't uh, approach your children all the same. And this man, he had one child that was stayed home. He went to church. He did what was right. He uh, didn't give any kind of problems. He worked hard, never caused his daddy a, a problem. But then the younger son was a whole different story. The younger son, they both had the same dad. They both lived in the same house, had the same uh, dad listened to his dad's convictions. They both had the same authority, the same rules. But you're going to find that they were as different as night and day. The, the older son, you don't see where he caused the problem. But the younger son, he was a whole other story. He had rebellion in his heart. I don't know if he grew up with rebellion, if he was that way from a young child and he's always uh, fighting against the authority of his father and of the Lord. I don't know if he was just like his older brother for the most part, but somewhere rebellion and influence had begun to enter into his, his life. And, and I will tell you that you can have the godliest home that you want to, but if your kids have influences that are wicked outside the home, that will influence their thinking, their discernment, and, and the way they perceive and, and the way that they, that they view things. And somewhere or another, rebellion entered into his heart. Because if you look at verse number 12, the younger of them, he said this, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Do you understand? He wasn't asking, he was demanding. He knew that there was an inheritance that one day would be his. He also knew that uh, one day his father would give him the means to either start a business or start a farm or start something uh, give him an inheritance that was saved back just for him. But he is in the state of, of mind, if you will, in the stage in his life. If it were in today's, if it were happening today, the boy just turned 18. He realized by law that his daddy couldn't tell him what to do anymore. He didn't like his daddy's rules, didn't like the authority, didn't like uh, what his daddy wouldn't allow him to do. So his attitude was this, I'm 18, I can do what I want to, I've got money coming to me, just give me what's mine and I am out of here. And that's essentially what that boy was telling his daddy, I want my inheritance, I want it right now, I have plans, I don't want to be under your rules anymore. More. I want to do what I want to do. I still say that boy had influences somewhere out there outside the home, and his younger son demanded, give me my portion. He didn't, it wasn't that he earned it, it's that his daddy had an inheritance set aside, and he demanded, give me my portion. That was arrogant, and there's no place for arrogance in a child's heart towards their parents. But arrogance comes along with sin. If you've got sin and you've got wickedness, arrogance is going to show up because that's what sin does. That's the personality of sin. He could have been a, a, a boy that was uh, just listened to his daddy, never gave a problem. But when sin enters into your heart, arrogance comes along with it. You developed a bad attitude. And his son had that bad attitude, and it's called rebellion. Rebellion is a, an unbelief is the sin of witchcraft, but I'm telling you, rebellion has broken the hearts of a lot of parents over the years. I could imagine all going all the way back to Adam and Eve when Cain did what he did and had the rebellion in his heart. He rebelled just like this young boy. He rebelled against his parents and rebelled against God. You do both. You can't rebel against one and not rebel, get, rebel against both. And I'll tell you something else about what was going on in this young man's mind. He had planned this out long before he ever got the courage up and the day came that he now demanded his inheritance from his father. It plan had been in his mind way before the words came out of his mouth. You see, very seldom do we ever just sin uh, just all at once. This boy had knew that there was a far country this boy knew what sin existed. 
He knew, according to the lust of his heart and the temptations, what he wanted to do when he left home. He had it all planned, and I'd say he had a circle of friends that were encouraging him, just get that pocket full of money, get away from your dad, and let's just go have fun and see the world. You see, he's not hanging around in a far country with a youth group. He ain't going down there on a, on a mission trip. He's not standing on the corner handing out Bible tracts. He's not down there to plant a church. He is down there to get away from God, get away from the teaching, get away from living right, get away from his daddy, and he wants to get away from everything that hinders him from doing what's going on in his mind and his heart now. His group of friends, I don't think they're down there for Bible study. They're not part of a prayer group. They're a group that hates rules. They hate authority. And what they're looking for was drugs and drinking and a wild time to be had. Somewhere or another, somebody who had already been to a far country, somebody that already experienced the sin and the temptations that it offered, had came back with stories about what was down there. He didn't learn it at home. He didn't learn it from his daddy. This was a time where it wasn't an internet and it wasn't, <coughs> excuse me, and it, and it wasn't TV. This was tales that who had been in a far country and experienced these sins, brought it back and told them what was going on and where to find it. That far country, you could call that in our day and time in this country, Las Vegas. I imagine every country has one. The things that are, Ill, that are illegal everywhere else in the country are not illegal in Las Vegas. People, it's broadcast worldwide as Sin City. The things that you can't buy here, you can buy there. The things that you can't have are not privy to here, you are there. So somewhere in that far country was a type of a Las Vegas that offered things he couldn't get where he lived. So he left where he lived and went to where the devil offered him a whole lot what he couldn't get. Las Vegas and this far country, it's where sin is affordable. You see, all he wanted was his money. He wasn't looking for anything else. He wasn't down there to start a business. He wasn't representing the family business. He simply wanted money because sin does cost money, and it takes money to do the type of sin that he was looking for. And sin is a, when you got the money, the devil makes it affordable. It entices people who are weak in their faith away from God, away from church, and away from godly living. So you understand the temptations was there. He had been sold a big, buck of, a big bunch of lies that said if you'll just get away from church and away from home, you'll go down there, you'll live better than you ever lived. You'll have more fun than you ever had. Nobody can tell you no. Nobody can tell you you can't do it. A devil disguise what sin really does and how the what's left over after you've had the good time, after you've experienced the sin, after you're broke, you see, the devil doesn't paint those pictures. He doesn't paint the picture of the children hiding behind the door, the bruises on the wife. He doesn't hide that the scared and the anxiety and the fright. He hides all that. They don't tell you about that. Let's tell you, you'll have all the most fun. But notice he's got another son. You see, he had two sons. They had the same father, the same home, the same rules, the same prayer at supper. It was, a, excuse me, it was all there. But he divided unto them. Now, this boy, the older son, he didn't go down to the far country. He put his money up. He going to use it wisely. The older son stayed in church. He stayed at home. He stayed responsible. He stayed respectful of his daddy. Dear friend, we are living in a time where children have lost respect for their parents. You just go to different stores or you go to different places out where there's groups of people and you're going to find there's times where they talk awful to their parents. I'm telling you, people, rebellion, whether it's with children and parents, whether it's with adults and their supervisors or their work, whether it's with authority, the law, rebellion will cause you to rebel against any type of authority. These two boys were raised in the same house. They had the same rules. They experienced the same unconditional love. They had the same parents. They both worked in the family business. They both helped their dad. They both had the same opportunities. They ate at the same table. They heard the same prayer at breakfast and lunch and dinner. 
They was raised in the same church, but the results were different. One stayed faithful, and the other, dear friend, rebellion found its way into his heart, his mind, and now into his life. Notice what he, excuse me, what he says in verse number 13. And not many days the younger son gathered all together, and then he took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. You see, he wore the clothes that his daddy bought. He wore them to that far country. But when he turned 18, all the temptations and the wicked plans took over. The ungodly friends that he found that they all worked the plan up together. They were going to do this together and they were going to go together and they were going to have fun together and they at least had each other and they all told one another, nobody's ever going to tell me no or I can't. And they started doing down there what they couldn't do at home, the parties and the drinking and the lust that they had in their bodies. But I tell you all the thing that he took the money, but I, I, I'm going to say, guess, I'd say he didn't take a Bible. I say he took some clothes, he took the money, but he didn't take a Bible. And you understand when you try to separate from the Bible and the Bible's no longer the influence in your life, dear friend, then the flesh will start to win and take over. Then the Bible says he wasted his living. Do you know what wasted means? Wasted means that he spent it on no good purpose. Isn't that sin? You tell me what benefit when you spend your hard-earned money that should go to your family and, and use it for the glory of God. What good purpose is when you've drunk it up or you've, you've uh, took it in pills or shot it in your veins and you've wasted it on. You just go after again and again and again and you've got nothing to show for it. There's no benefit to uh, wasting your money. There's no good purpose. And you notice he only took what he could spend. It's that pocket full of money. That was his drive. That money had become his Bible. That money had, had become his intentions. That money had become his source. As long as he had money, he didn't have a worry in this world. Isn't it true that when rebellion is in your heart, as long as you've got the money, everything's good? You don't, he didn't, uh, you don't find that he took any work clothes. You don't find that he took any tools. He wasn't starting a business. He wasn't going down there to work. He wasn't going down there for a job. He was going down there to waste his money in sin. Righteous living. Now here's what rebellion will do. What he used to sneak and do when he was at home and around the, the people of his community, he'd sneak and do it. But now he's in a far country. He doesn't care who knows it. It becomes public sin. And what people who get away from God do is they do things in secret where they think nobody knows. But listen, we live in a small country community. There ain't no such thing as a secret from everybody. Somebody knows what you're doing. And you're going to find that he got to the place where he didn't care. And we've all seen it, dear friend. They start out slow. They start out just a little bit, dabbling here and a little bit there. The next thing you know, they don't even care anymore that anybody knows or what anybody thinks. They're so given over to sin that they just commit to sin in, in public view and Everybody know. Now listen, nobody, they didn't have telephones. They didn't see it on the internet. But somebody who had been to that far country saw this boy doing what he was doing and came back and told his daddy because the older son knew exactly and threw a fit, said he's wasted, he's shamed us, he's brought back shame on this family, on God and on our church. And you understand what he's done. They knew what he was doing. But he didn't care. You see, it's involving public disorder. It's when you publicly do what it is you're doing. Let me tell you what open sin will do. It'll bring shame on you. It'll bring shame on your family. It'll bring shame on the church you attend. It'll bring shame on God. But once sin takes over a life, he didn't care who saw him do what it is that he was doing. I imagine that the boy never prayed one prayer till everything was taken from him and he found himself alone, starving, broke, in a hog pen. So you understand, when the money ran out, oh my nerve, things began to change. 
the Bible says the next thing, he spin off. And when you're in a far country and he's on a farm that raises pigs, he wasn't growing his own food. He didn't have his own garden. He didn't have his way of making food. He'd done spent all of his money. He was completely broke. And now there was a famine where there was a land of plenty. You see, not only, not only did his money run out, but a curse came upon that land. And God's not going to bless in a far land where sin abounds. Had he been a famine in his land, he could have made it. But he's in a far land. He'd had no family. Nobody loved him down there. Nobody cared about him down there. So he began to be in want. He's broke. He's lonely. He's alone. And he is unwanted. He's hungry. But the most thing I think hurt the most, he's unloved. You see, there's things you can only get at home, dear friend. You get unconditional love when you're at home. You get food at home. You get clothes at home. You get, if you're broke, it's all right. You're never alone when you're at home. And at home, somebody wants you. So you understand, when you walk away from home and you walk away from parents and you walk away from God, this is the real world. This is what the real world has to offer. Absolutely nothing. As long as he had money to spend, he had friends. As long as he had money to spend, he had the sin in his life. As long as he had money to spend, he had food to eat, he had clothes to wear, and he wasn't alone. And it seemed like everybody wanted to be his friend and be around him, but when the money ran out, everything money can buy ran out with it. You see, what you get at home is stuff money can't buy. Unconditional love. Parents that'll love you no matter what. You get a family that you're surrounded by. You see, it's, it's, this is a whole lot about no family that cared. And don't you know that now his mind isn't on the sin that he couldn't wait to get to? But dear friend, his mind was on what he walked away from at home. Loving parents, godly parents, that were there for him. He wasn't hungry at home. He was loved when he was at home. Because the devil's sin is a whole lot like cotton candy. Before I knew I was a diabetic, I used to love cotton candy. It, you could put that in, there in your mouth and it tastes so good. It's nothing but sweet sugar. It disappears immediately. So you get you another bite and another bite. And once the cotton candy's gone, it leaves two things. Number one, it leaves, it leaves you sticky. Because once you touch it, it's on you. And it also leaves a residue because everybody can just look at you and see that you've been eating cotton candy. You just get it all over you. Sin's the same way. You can look at sin, at somebody that's got sin in their life. You may not know what they're into, but you'll know that sin has got a hold of them. It changes you. People look upon you and they see that you're not the same person that you once was. And so when you leave home, understand that's what's waiting for you. So he joined himself to a citizen who wasn't his family. These people didn't love him. They just needed him to feed their pigs. And so now he's feeding pigs. And the Bible says he would have starved had it not been for him trying to compete with the pigs in the hog pen to eat the husk that fell from the sycamore tree. You understand that's a long way from a good meal that mama fixes you, a good meal, the fatted calf that his daddy would give him when he returned home, all the vegetables. Let me tell you something. Uh, once we marry, our wife becomes our best cook, but until that happens, your mama's cook, the best cook you can eat it. Only he wasn't eating his mama's cooking. Now he was competing for the food that fell from a tree before the pigs could get it, and they don't like to share. He's not at the family table. Them pigs didn't pray before they ate. He had to get to it first. And I believe he was on that hog, in that hog lot in them hog pen. He's surrounded by pigs instead of loved ones. And now he starts to remember what he walked away from. At home, my dad's got a lot more to eat than I'm eating right now. I never went hungry when I was at home. I never skipped a meal. I never woke up in a hog pen. I was never surrounded by all these swine. And you understand, I had it. I realize now I had it so good. Verse number 18. 
I will arise and go to my father. Do you hear what I just said, friend? My father. Do you realize what a gift he realized he now had? God gave him a father. Not just any father, but gave him a godly father. And notice what he said. He said, I'll arise and go to my father and say unto him, Father. He asked for his father. He didn't ask for his mom. He didn't ask for his brother. He didn't ask for his preacher. He didn't ask for his friends. He didn't ask for anybody else. He didn't want anybody else's father. But he said, my father. He just realized God's greatest gift in his life had been his dad. You see, sometimes we realize that too late. And dear friend, if you can hear my voice this morning and your father's still living, thank God for him. You see, home is where you can fail and you're loved anyway. The world will beat you, but home will bless you. You see, his dad's prayers made it to the hog lot. You'll notice his dad didn't go get him. His dad didn't want that rebellious son. His dad wanted that godly son. And you see, he didn't go get him out of there. He let it run its course. He sent God. And the prayers that he prayed every night for that boy, even though he knew where he was and what he was doing, he said, God, I want that son I used to have because the Bible plainly says that my son was dead, but now I've got my original son back. The rebellion's gone, and i got a loving son. That son was dead, but now he's alive again because, you see, the dad knew that God could do what he couldn't do himself. And I believe I, what he says, I will arise. And there was something about he knew that no matter what he had done, that his father would love him unconditionally and take him back. You see, if our kids know that even though they fail, even though they rebel, even though they get caught up into sin, they've always got to know that we have unconditional love and we will love them no matter what. We'll not always approve of what they do. We'll not approve of the sin in their life. But we will love them unconditionally. And just as our Heavenly Father takes us back when we repent, a good godly father will take their children back when they repent. It looks like time has come and gone. Well, as you see this right here, and I'll leave you with this. When the far country rejected him, his father did not. When the devil threw him away, his father accepted him back. God bless all the fathers this morning. God bless you and thank you for listening.